Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We're going to wait just a minute while everyone joins and we, and we will get started. Welcome again. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first implementation webinar of the Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap. Today, we're gonna to talk about how to get started with the new roadmap and explore the new resources of the implementation guide, issue maps, and also get to hear from three of the state and local health departments featured as case studies. I wanna remind you that you can submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar throughout the webinar. We'll answer all the ones that we can in the Q&A box. We'll hopefully have some time for questions at the end of the webinar. And if not, we'll reach back out with an FAQ document whenever we send the recording. You can also activate closed captioning on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Can go ahead and go to the next slide. We will be recording today's session and we will make the slides available as well as the recording to everyone who registered in the next few days. We will also have the recording posted on our YouTube channel about a month after the webinar. You can also follow along with the new resources that we're going to be talking about today. If you go to alz.org slash HBI roadmap, which is also in the chat, if you wanna copy and paste that or click on it there, you can download the new resources that we will be talking about today. So today, we're what are we gonna talk about? We are going to go over three ways to get started. We'll talk about the outcomes, the implementation guide, and the issue maps. We're also joined by CDC's John O'Mura, who's going to talk to us a little bit about community clinical linkages. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll end with a panel discussion about roadmap implementation, um, where we'll feature three of the state and local health department staff who have been doing this work in practice. So really excited about that. This work and all of the work of the Healthy Brain Initiative is funded um, by the CDC, so we thank them for that funding. Go ahead to the next slide. All right, before we dive in, we would like to know a little bit more about who you are and who we have, um, who we have with us today. So if you'll take a minute to answer the poll and let us know about what best describes your job or what brings you here today? Thank you so much everybody for responding. We're having lots of responses come in, so we'll give it just a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And then I think I shared the results with you. So hopefully that you hopefully you can see those, but it looks like we have mostly health uh, public health professionals and healthcare professionals with us here today. And then a few of you are community members, caregivers, and even um, some people living with dementia. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, the HBI roadmap is a public health framework for making impactful change in our communities. So I hope that you all learned something interesting today and we're um, excited to hear your questions as we move through. So you can go ahead to the next slide. 
So we've been starting all of our presentations on the roadmap off with this vision statement that helped to guide us through the development process. And that is that everyone deserves a life with the healthiest brain possible. As many of us are here as part of our jobs, we also often have a connect, personal connection to Alzheimer's or dementia or our personal why behind why we do the work that we do. I know for me, when I've been talking about the roadmap recently, I've been uh, talking about how I always have my grandmother top of mind who you know, many, many years ago was one of those people who we were told it was better to just not tell her about her dementia diagnosis. Um, and then as we talk about the Healthy Brain Initiative and the different ways we're impacting our community, I, I also like to keep in mind my kids, all the kids running around at the elementary school and my friends and community and just how this work is both a way to improve the health of our communities, improve the accessibility of our communities and really just build, build community and work together. So I'll just invite you to think about that why for yourself as we move through these next few intro slides. Go to the next slide. All right, the roadmap. If you missed our launch webinar in July, I invite you to go watch that recording or just watch the video that is on the website that Juan just put into the chat. It gives a nice overview of the document, um, but we wanted to just remind you here of what it looks like. And if you don't have your heart copy yet, I'm holding mine up with that blurry screen, but um, we invite you to get, get your hard copy, especially all of you who said you're public health professionals, especially if you work at a state or local health department, please reach out to your local Alzheimer's Association chapter to find out how to get that hard copy. We do have copies across the country at those chapter offices waiting for you. And our, our team will also be at the Gerontological Society of America conference in Tampa in the beginning of November as well as the American Public Health Association conference in the middle of November. So we'll have booths at both of those conferences. And if you're going to be there, we invite you to come by and get a copy. And we would love to chat with you about the roadmap. We'll go ahead to the next slide. So in that initial webinar, uh, just a, a quick review. One of the things we talked about that's new with this roadmap is that we updated the wheel. So if you're familiar with the HBI roadmap series, you know, we we try to have a graphic that helps to, if we had to explain the roadmap in one graphic, here it is. So in this wheel, you'll see the four domains that make up the actions of the roadmap. And those are strengthen partnerships and policies, measure, evaluate, and utilize data, build a diverse and skilled workforce, and engage and educate the public. So all of the actions that you see in the roadmap fall under one of those four domains. We've centered all of those actions around health equity because that was a central point to the development of the actions. And then around the outside edge, we have the different areas of practice, risk reduction, early detection diagnosis, caregiving, and community clinical linkages, which we're gonna go into all of those a little bit more today when you see the different resources in the issue maps. We'll go to the next slide. The other key message from the roadmap is that there is opportunity for public health input across the life course. So what you see in this graphic is um, the opportunity for primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, which are our very public health words to say risk reduction, early detection diagnosis, and safety of, and quality of care. There are opportunities for public health impact from healthy cognitive functioning through severe dementia. And there are different things we can do to improve the health of our communities, to improve the health of individuals. We can advocate for access to care. We can talk about ways to get people into treatment. And then we can also be there to be the support surrounding individuals and communities as people are diagnosed with dementia, as we're supporting the safety and quality of their care and supporting their caregivers. We'll go ahead to the next slide. All right, so let's dive in. How do we get started? 
So again, uh, talking to many of you today and hearing that most of you are public health professionals, we're, we're assuming you came here today for this information um, that you heard our, heard our longer intro, but hopefully that was, that was enough to um, jog your memory about the why we're here, but how do you get started? So if you have the roadmap or if you have gone to the website and opened up the roadmap, it, it is a long book, right? So it can be a little bit intimidating of where do you go? How do you get started? How do you dive in? Even if you've been doing this work before, um, I know personally it can be frustrating when your favorite guidebook comes out with a brand new one. How do you know? How do you get started with this new initiative? So I'm going to go over the first thing to do to get started, and then I'm going to turn it over to John Sheehan on our team, um, who will go through the next two. So let's let's dig in and go to the next slide here for the first way to get started. So the first way that we want to um, offer to you all to get started is with the outcomes in the roadmap. There are nine outcomes in the roadmap and the way that they're worded, it really gives the opportunity to think about what you, your health department, um, your community organization, what are you wanting to do with um, the actions within the roadmap? And this can, this can help guide you. So do you wanna increase community partnerships? If you do, go to the P domain and you can check out the four actions under that outcome to see different ideas, different actions to take about increasing community partnerships. Do you want to increase public knowledge about brain health, risk factors for dementia, or the benefits of early detection and diagnosis? You can go over to the E domain and read about the five actions under that outcome within the E domain. So we hope that this is a way um, to kind of break down the actions. There's 24 total, so that can be a lot to read through, but taking them domain by domain and reading through these outcomes to think about what is it that you want to do? What is the impact that you want to have in your community? This can be a great first way to get started. So with that, I am going to turn it over to John to talk about the next two things. John? Thank you so much, Shelby, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, our second way uh, out of three to get started is with our just released implementation guide. Uh, this you can find at alls.org slash HBI roadmap and do encourage you to, uh, to follow along uh, with these next few slides here. Our guide is called Prioritizing Action in the Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap, Eight Questions for Thoughtful Action. Uh, we're not going to go through this document line by line. It's not as long as the, the roadmap itself, uh, but still longer than, uh, than, than we'll have time for on this webinar. Uh, but today I want to give you an overview of what you'll find inside and some ideas about how you can utilize this tool uh, as you, as your health department, as your community starts to undertake these public health actions in brain health. Next slide. We designed the implementation guide uh, with a range of capacity in mind. Uh, it is designed for health departments who are just beginning this work. They're just starting uh, engagement with uh, brain health, dementia, and caregiving issues. But we also designed it for uh, those health departments that are further along uh, and looking to elevate their existing efforts. The release of the roadmap was just a couple of months ago, uh, and so we are designing all of these tools uh, to help the larger public health field uh, embrace that new the, the new roadmap understand what uh, carried forward from previous editions and how we can implement actions uh, nationwide to uh, better address uh, better address the public health approach to dementia. The entire guide itself actually expands on the key questions within the roadmap. You can see a screenshot of that up on your screen right now. Uh, these are all on page 22 uh, if you're following along at home. And uh, the implementation guide takes these eight questions and expands on them uh, to give you a better idea of key considerations uh, to think through as you're planning action. And just as we heard with, uh, with the domains, uh, like, the, like the domains, the implementation guide builds on itself. Uh, the key questions build on them uh, so that the implementation guide uh, can get you to a, a full, uh, full complete picture of work uh, at the end. Next slide. How, how is it structured? Uh, we took those eight questions uh, for thoughtful action and we broke them into five different sections. 
Uh, you can see those up on your screen and the corresponding question is uh, on the left hand side in those uh, colored circles. We designed the section so that you, your health department, uh, your coalitions, uh, your partners who are working on this, you can scan quickly through each of these five sections uh, and, and uh, figure out kind of where you are at, where your community is at in the process. Uh, so for, for example, if you're just beginning this work, starting with the very first section, building and sustaining a, a coalition, great place to start. Uh, but if you have a coalition in place already, uh, a council, a task force, maybe you're at the identifying needs and opportunities stage of, of development. Maybe you're further along and you're looking at evaluation and sharing impact. Uh, so these five sections are made and designed to be scannable so you can quickly enter the process uh, wherever you're at. And just as with any public health work, uh, we know that as soon as you get from question one all the way through question eight, doesn't mean that the work is done or, or complete by any means, uh, but you can re-enter the process, elevate the work uh, to ensure that we're reaching uh, the greatest number of people, uh, impacting the greatest number of lives across our communities. Next slide. What will you find inside the implementation guide? Uh, the first thing that we start off with is those key questions, the eight questions from the roadmap itself. Uh, it, each section has one or two questions uh, that are designed to kickstart that discussion. How do you talk about building and sustaining a coalition? What are the questions to ask yourself, ask your coalition members, ask the rest of your department? You'll also find quick tips for success. Uh, these are just key considerations to keep in mind as you're having this discussion uh, about this specific topic. We included references and page numbers to the, the HBI roadmap itself. Uh, these include definitions, data, um, as well as uh, uh, references back to the case studies uh, that you'll find in the roadmap and that we're going to hear um, a sampling of later today uh, during our panel discussion. And finally, on the screen, you'll see the considerations for discussion and planning. Uh, these are the uh, expanded ideas for food for thought. Uh, as you're talking about uh, each individual section. So as you're thinking through building your coalition, uh, assessing the existing work groups on brain health or related topics in your jurisdiction, in your area. What are ways that you can think through that? What are key questions to ask yourself uh, to have a thorough, comprehensive discussion about it? Next slide. Uh, you'll also find scattered throughout the implementation guide data and other resources that can help with this process, provide additional detail, provide additional context. Many of the elements uh, are in the roadmap itself, uh, but here you're going to find those additional links, the hyperlinks, additional tools, uh, just to help with that implementation uh, uh, easy ease of access. And finally, did include additional context from the roadmap itself. Uh, depending on the section. So here, for example, you'll see the framework that Shelby just shared with us. And this is presented during the identifying needs and opportunities section uh, as a way to help uh, generate ideas among uh, health department personnel, among coalition members uh, about those domains, uh, about those actions and outcomes. What are ways to identify that we don't have our, our coalition as uh, thoroughly established as, uh, as we would like, or our workforce is really where we want to identify um, some additional needs and opportunities. So with that, we can move to our third and final way uh, to get started, uh, which are our newly released as well issue maps. Uh, these are topic specific, uh, topic specific documents, four pages long, and they align to the areas of practice of the Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap. They're designed to be digestible ways for health departments to align their efforts uh, to brain health across other programs. There are five issue maps in total, and you can see uh, uh, quick snapshots of them up on your screen, ensuring early detection and diagnosis, supporting caregivers, advancing health equity, enhancing community clinical linkages, and reducing the risk of cognitive impairment. Next slide, please. Uh, each of the five issue maps follow a similar structure, and they start with this topic overview you can see on the left-hand side. So we looked at the roadmap and uh, parse out what does the roadmap say about each of these topics? What does the roadmap say about risk reduction? What does it say about early detection? And we compiled that together into this overview. Uh, what exactly could be those digestible bits for state and local public health departments uh, what are the things they need to know about this particular topic? 
Each of the issue maps also feature uh, associated compelling data. This is to really help make that public health case for action on each of the topics. Uh, what is the case for taking action uh, to better support caregivers, to increase those community clinical linkages, uh, to better address health equity in dementia and public health? And I, I really think the, the issue maps are a great way to think about how brain health and dementia and caregiving intersect with uh, other areas of our public health practice. Uh, we know that like risk reduction is a stalwart of a lot of chronic disease efforts. Uh, and so if your health department, for example, has already prioritized risk reduction uh, of other chronic conditions, uh, other pr primary prevention strategies, you can take this risk reduction issue map, open it up, find the associated HBI roadmap actions uh, along the right-hand side there, and see how that brain health element may integrate and intersect into those other efforts. So I think they're a really great way for that cross-divisional, cross-program, cross-condition uh, uh, discussion uh, to better align all of our, our resources and our efforts. And our final slide on the issue maps uh, discusses the fourth and final page. Again, it's only four pages long. Uh, the very back page of each of the issue maps uh, features short summaries of the HBI collaborative partners. Uh, if you don't know, the HBI Collaborative is a multi-component approach uh, to help us reach that vision that we saw right at the beginning of this presentation, helping every single person uh, live their life with the healthiest brain possible. The HBI Collaborative is co-chaired by CDC and the Alzheimer's Association, and the members uh, are those organizations funded by CDC to implement the National Healthy Brain Initiative and the Bold Centers of Excellence, uh, the Bold Public Health Centers of Excellence. So on your screen, I know it's a, uh, there's a lot to see there, but on your screen, you can see the logos of the members uh, who are part of the HBI Collaborative, and each of us are charged with helping state, local, and tribal public health practitioners uh, implement the roadmap, implement the roadmap series. Uh, promote brain health across all of our communities. So I encourage each of you to uh, look through those issue maps, uh, take a look at the backside, the last page in there, uh, to learn about these great partners, uh, and visit hbicollaborative.org uh, for that contact information uh, to reach out to any of us. So those are our three ways to get started with the HBI roadmap, different ways to enter the, the same process, uh, and hopefully that gives you some ideas for how to connect uh, the brain health component to the priorities that are existing within your community, uh, within your department already. So if you're like me, I know uh, you might have a lot of tabs open uh, in your browser currently. You've been clicking on all the links here. I definitely encourage you to take some time uh, after this, read through the materials, uh, and of course, we'll provide some contact information uh, at the end of today's presentation. So with that, uh, to go to our next slide very quickly, uh, I want to help uh, invite a speaker to help connect some of those ideas that we just talked about. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. John Omura. He is the medical officer for the Alzheimer's disease team at CDC, and uh, I've invited him here today to provide some food for thought on how public health can utilize uh, community clinical linkages for dementia and for brain health. John? Well, great. Thank you so much, John, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to present to you all today. As, as John mentioned, my name is also John, John Omura. Uh, I am a medical officer on the CDC's Alzheimer's disease team. Um, I'm really excited to help set the stage for you all today, specifically regarding community clinical linkages. And we often refer to community clinical linkages as CCLs for short. Um, and the topic of community clinical linkages is integrated, as you'll see, throughout the new HPI roadmap. Um, and as has been mentioned, there's an accompanying issue map regarding CCL, so that it, this is all very exciting for us. Um, so first, just a bit about community clinical linkages, and in particular, CDC's focus on this as a topic area and really public health strategy. Uh, so what are community clinical linkages? Well, well, they are really connections made between healthcare, public health, and community-based sectors, all with the goal of improving population health. Uh, and these connections can really help reduce health disparities by bridging the gap between clinical care, community or self-care, and then the broader public health infrastructure. 
Uh, and so public health has prioritized community clinical linkages as an effective approach to help prevent and control chronic diseases, uh, including uh, dementia. And, and we know that when clinical and community sectors work synergi synergistically through these types of linkages, it can really help to ultimately improve care and support patients better than either of these sectors could do alone. Um, so that's, you know, really exciting and really the foundation for our emphasis on this as a topic area. And then also just related to that, I wanted to give a few remarks regarding the social de social determinants of health or SDOHs. At CDC, certainly our work is deeply rooted in advancing health equity by addressing the social determinants of health uh, in order to help reduce barriers and promote health and wellness for all. And so at CDC, within the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, which is where our, our program lies, um, our center aims to really address five social determinants of health um, that are strongly tied to chronic disease conditions and communities that are most effective. So those five social determinants of health are the built environment, uh, food and nutrition security, tobacco-free policies, social connectedness, and then importantly, the fifth one for this uh, topic or for this conversation today is community clinical linkages. So then from there, understanding the importance of uh, CCLs, then we can ask, you know, how can public health support community clinical linkages for dementia and brain health? And so organizations and individuals who work within public health, all of us can help lead efforts to really link these two sectors in a variety of ways. So for example, public health can help establish and maintain strategic partnerships. We are conveners really uh, within community and clinical sectors. Public health can then help facilitate the connection between those community and clinical sectors. Public health can contribute important infrastructure and capacity support. Um, so for example, content area expertise, subject matter expertise, uh, such as evaluation, uh, funding opportunities and staffing as just some examples. Public health can provide that population-based perspective on local or jurisdictional related issues related to chronic disease prevention and control. Uh, public health can inform and educate and engage practitioners and community representatives about the latest evidence-based approaches and strategies. And public health can also link and align local and state efforts to national initiatives, such as, of course, the Healthy Brain Initiative. And CDC's Division of Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention has several fantastic resources that I wanted to mention that can help support public health professionals in the area of community clinical linkages. So for example, they have a practitioner's guide as well as a community clinical linkages health equity guide. Um, and so within the practitioner's guide, for example, it that guide outlines a strategy for establishing and maintaining community clinical linkages. Um, and so following that strategy within the practitioner's guide, the first step of the strategy is to learn about your community's resources and clinical sectors. And so just as an example, the Alzheimer's Association maintains a community resource finder uh, that provides information on community and medical services, as well as classes offered by the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Association. And so by working with your local Alzheimer's uh, Association chapter, you can increase relationships within the community and healthcare uh, organizations and increase access to available resources within your jurisdiction. And so then finally, uh, we can ask the question, you know, what does this mean for the roadmap? What is the connection to the HBI roadmap? Well, as I mentioned, uh, CCLs or community clinical linkages are integrated throughout the new HBI roadmap um, and really served as a foundational role in its development. Um, so the conceptual framework for the roadmap that Shelby outlined, that figure, uh, as she mentioned, consists of four domains built from the essential public health services of equity and surrounded by those areas of practice across the life course. And as Shelby mentioned, one of those areas of practice is in fact community clinical linkages. Um, and so during the development of the roadmap, um, uh, the, the leadership committee uh, established five expert work groups um, and each of those were formed to focus on one specific topic area to ultimately develop recommendation actions for the roadmap or for the document. One of those topic specific work groups was on community clinical linkages. 
students. Um, and so the leadership committee uh, members chaired each work group and additional subject matter experts joined those work groups. And the work groups really developed overarching as well as topic specific recommended actions, including the actions that you see now in the roadmap regarding community clinical linkages. Uh, and so again, based on those recommendations from that work group, you can see CCLs integrated throughout the roadmap actions. And so just to give you one example, um, there is action P2, which reads to utilize community clinical linkages to improve equitable access to community-based chronic disease chronic disease prevention, dementia support, and healthy aging programs. And I did want to mention that, you know, this can be certainly for community-based programs specific to brain health and dementia, uh, but it can also mean linking to programs that focus on modifiable risk factors for dementia, because we know that supporting progress and decreasing those risk factors will also ultimately support and contribute to brain health. And then, of course, as was mentioned, there is also the issue map regarding community clinical linkages that we help. We hope will be a helpful resource for you all. So just to reiterate, this new edition of the roadmap has an increased focus on CCLs. We are really excited about uh, this emphasis for its ability to really better support the populations that we all serve, and also for its ability to help address important social determinants of health and advance health equity. Um, so I really hope this information uh, in my talk, as well as this uh, wonderful webinar overall, is helpful for you. And we really look forward to seeing the amazing and impactful work that you all do in this area moving forward. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to you now, John. Great. Thank you so much, John. Uh, and hi, everyone. I, I'm uh, As a little preference and a uh, uh, queue up, Shelby, I'm having some uh, sudden internet issues. Uh, so if I suddenly drop off, uh, Shelby will, will hop in. Uh, but thank you so much, John, for, for those remarks. Uh, it was great stage setting for those community clinical linkages. Uh, and I'm pleased to continue this great discussion uh, with our panelists. Uh, we're going to hear from those uh, state and local public health practitioners. Uh, you can see them up on your screen here, and I'll introduce them in just a second. Uh, but the work I wanted to highlight uh, that you're going to hear about is uh, featured in those case studies uh, in the roadmap. They start on page 43. I encourage you to take a look through them. Uh, but we're so lucky that we actually get to hear uh, straight from the source uh, about this great work. And I'm very pleased to introduce our panel. Uh, first up, uh, I'll, read, uh, I'll introduce everyone, and then we'll hear uh, remarks from each of our panelists. Uh, Patty Takawera, the Community Health Planner from the Minnesota Department of Health. Victoria Parker, Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Program Manager for the Rhode Island Department of Health, and Jim McGill, the Assistant Commissioner for Aging and Care Services with the Baltimore City Health Department. Uh, so please help me uh, welcome all three of our panelists, uh, and we are going to start off with Patty today. Uh, so Patty, thank you so much for, for being here. I uh, wanted to pitch the question to you. Uh, through several unique partnerships, the Minnesota Department of Health has trained community health workers about the importance of brain health and oral health. Tell us a bit about those partnerships and how community health workers in Minnesota are now uh, helping support the brain health of those in their communities. Sure. Thank you, um, John and, and the rest of the team for putting on this awesome webinar. Um, I know I always love case examples the most, so I'm glad that we can provide these. Um, so in 2017, we had a Healthy Brain Initiative grant at MDH. Um, and as part of that work, our oral health unit actually um, created some uh, modules and trained um, community health workers to provide training to caregivers to support people, the people that they're caring for with dementia um, on oral health needs. So that was in partnership with an organization called Volunteers of America, Culturally Responsive Caregiver Support and Dementia Services Team. Um, and they employ CHWs to support caregivers through a variety of different programs. Um, they have a mobile memory care unit that does a full, um, provides a full workup for you know, anyone in the community. Um, and then they link um, those people to needed services and support, including their own programs or primary care. Um, and so uh, community health workers through um, the VOA program um, were trained to um, 
uh, support oral health care and then trained caregivers. Uh, so it was a train the trainer model. Um, and then with the bold grant funding, we were able to kind of expand on this partnership with Volunteers of America or VOA. Um, and we're trying to think about, you know, what's sort of the next step to move move upstream in the way we wanted to with uh, the bold grant funds. Um, and so we worked with the Volunteers of America team and designed, this was during COVID too, so all of their programs had turned virtual uh, for the time being, um, caregiver support groups and other programs. And they developed a new program specific for, to the African-American community um, called Know Your Know Your Risks Brain Health. And it's really more focused on dementia risk reduction. Um, and again, the audience is a lot of caregivers who are, you know, managing their own health and well-being. Um, <clears throat> and we are also, um, you know, kind of expanding that community health worker training um, initiative and partnering with our Minnesota Community Health Worker Alliance to um, develop a series of modules specific to uh, the CHW role in um, in the spectrum of prevention. So all the way from risk reduction, early detection, uh, caregiver support and well-being and um, care management. And so like what the CHW's role is in, in those spaces and includes case studies throughout. And so we're in, um, in a finalizing those modules and piloting them and then we'll disseminate them more broadly. But the good thing about them is that they'll be really relevant to lots of different types of um, you know, community health navigator professions, including community health workers. And finally, um, kind of the next phase going into our new uh, bold grant cycle is that we are um, with the VOA team, we just started having some community conversations with uh, hairstyles at hairstyles at barbershops and hair salons about um, what their role as a trusted community messenger could be uh, in dementia risk reduction and caregiver support. Um, and those just happened at the end of September. And so we're really excited to sort of dig in and hear the perspective of the hairstylists, um, and like what they're seeing and hearing and how we can work with the Volunteers of America to train um, stylists in their community. So we're really excited to, to move in that direction too. Are That's we so taking fun. questions uh, or after? Yeah, so we'll we'll take questions. We'll take questions at the end, uh, Patty. But thank you so much for uh, for that that wonderful overview. Um, I love that partnership with with VOA. It's an organization that um, isn't necessarily connected to like brain health or uh, you know even chronic dis disease for that matter. But a wonderful way to uh, get out into the community to meet people where they actually are. So that's I, I just love hearing about that. Uh, so we'll, we'll take you. questions at, at the end. Um, but I am pleased to uh, invite our next panelist uh, to join us uh, on screen, Victoria. And question for you, Victoria, excuse me, is uh, the Rhode Island Department of Health launched a quality improvement project last year uh, to improve dementia care through the primary care workforce. So tell us a bit about that project and uh, where you see it going in the next couple of months. Great. Yeah. Thanks, John. And thanks to the team for coordinating this webinar. I'm really pleased to be here to showcase some of the work that's happening here in Rhode Island. And as I think about the alignment to this project with the Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap, I, I feel like it really spans across the four domains. Um, you could you could make a case for connection, you know, with any of those domains and a lot of the areas of practice as well, um, including the community clinical linkages that John um, spoke about earlier. Um, but our project really stems from some of the larger kind of health system transformation efforts that have been happening within the state, really thinking about the care of a total population and not just one patient at a time. Um, so with that in mind, um, we did we are a state that received bold funding back in 2019 and again um, for this new funding cycle. So very excited to really move in towards sort of an implementation phase with this project. Um, but essentially in our first three years of funding, we convened a quality improvement collaborative. Um, so there's that kind of strengthening partnership um, kind of domain. Um, and our, our goal was to develop a model for primary care to better serve older adults and people with dementia. Um, so certainly 
certainly a, a tall order. Um, and what we thought we might do is um, kind of implement dementia specific quality measures within primary care and kind of do that through a quality improvement project. Um, one of the challenges that we noticed from the very beginning was that there are measures, quality measures that exist that are dementia specific, but to be in compliance with that measure, your patient population um, or, or the denominator of that measure has to be patients with a diagnosis. And we felt like that was actually kind of limiting, um, not because um, primary care doesn't serve that patient population, but um, we know that there are some challenges and maybe even inconsistencies with detection and diagnosis. So we thought we were really missing a whole group of people who could be um, cognitively vulnerable, who could have mild cognitive impairment, but didn't necessarily have um, a specific dementia diagnosis. So um, we backed off a bit from the dementia specific quality measure and moved towards towards um, the implementation of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement IHI age-friendly 4M care model. Um, so if you're, those are a lot of terms, but the, the 4Ms, if you're familiar with them, are medication, mobility, mentation, and what matters most. And um, it's a great way to organize care, essentially, um, for older adults. And um, that includes people with dementia as well as their caregivers. And under the what matters most measure, um, we're sort of challenging practices not only to think about what matters most to their patient, regardless of if they have dementia, but also what matters most to that person's identified caregiver. Um, so certainly trying to work in um, some of that caregiving piece as well. Um, so since submitting the success story to the roadmap and, and starting this new funding cycle, uh, we launched our project um, and started with an echo learning opportunity that invited um, a number of um, clinicians and other healthcare professionals from different areas of practice to come together and learn about what the 4M age-friendly framework is and how that could possibly improve care for patients with dementia and also older adult populations. Um, and that was a really wonderful launching point as sort of this learning opportunity um, for our many partners that had been involved in this work. Um, after the ECHO series, our goal was to recruit at least two practices to participate in the quality improvement initiative. And I'm really excited to say that we were able to recruit five primary care practices across the state, um, three traditional primary care, one geriatrics uh, practice and a PACE program um, that serves all of Rhode Island. Um, so the, the first sort of practice facilitation meeting um, took place in September, um, just last month. And we've also embedded um, our own set of learning collaboratives that is going to bring together each to the five practices at least three times in the next six months um, to really share best practices and, and sort of what's um, what they're experiencing um, through their QI implementation as they work to implement the four M's. Um, we have a second learning collaborative scheduled in November. Um, practices will be uh, presenting on their Plan, Do, Study, Act quality improvement templates uh, that we created for them um, and so, sort of sharing their work, um, challenges, barriers, and, and hopefully successes too um, as they implement the 4Ms. Um, and I do want to just highlight two partners that have been really instrumental in getting this work off the ground. One is our Rhode Island GWEP, which is the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. They are the group um, that hosts the ECHO series for us. They do all of the technical assistance for that identifying subject matter experts, making sure that the presenters are ready. That takes a lot of work, and then that's really led by that partner. And our other um, partner that I think is really important to mention here, they're called the Care Transformation Collaborative, or CTC Rhode Island. Um, historically, they've been involved in a lot of primary care transformation efforts. And so this just made so much sense um, working with them. Um, they are the people who sort of oversee our agreements with each of the primary care sites that we've recruited, as well as supply um, really needed and critical practice facilitation services to sort of lead and guide the practice through their um, quality improvement implementation. So we're not just saying, here you go, good luck, implement the 4M, see you in six months. But this practice facilitator is meeting with the practices monthly, um, connecting them to community-based organizations. So there's the sort of community clinical linkage happening um, and really leading and guiding um, the practice manager and other clinicians as they implement the, the quality improvement project. So um, we're only just beginning with that implementation cycle, um, but really excited that we have a, a second learning collaborative coming up and, and five um, really committed practices in this work.
Thank you so much, Victoria. That's incredibly exciting work to hear about. Um, the you know the innovation, uh, the adaptability that I think you and your department uh, exhibited for figuring out you know what are the those workarounds. How can we get to that quality improvement, knowing some of the difficulties with with data collection, with categorization. So uh, just wonderful, innovative work uh, coming out of your department. I'm so excited to hear now these these next steps that uh, that are being undertaken. So. Uh, excellent. Can't wait to hear the, the questions that come in. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our last uh, panelist for, uh, for today's discussion. Uh, so Jim, uh, with the Baltimore City Health Department, uh, your department has used a combination of partnerships and volunteer recruitment uh, to better reach the Black population in your city. How did those partnerships come together, and why do you focus on recruiting older adults uh, to engage that population? Thank you, John. I want to give a little bit of background, and I think in the course of, the, of this, I'll be responding to your question. Uh, Baltimore City Health Department is actually the oldest operating public health department in the country. We've been operating since 1793. I, I haven't been around uh, for quite that long, um, but uh, we have a long history of public health intervention, particularly in uh, communities that have uh, experienced inequities. And some new developments that really sort of are shaping our thinking in Baltimore that might be of interest to some of the other folks on this webinar. This past summer in July, there was a report released that the Alzheimer's Association International Conference that was the, in Amsterdam, which was the first uh, real assessment of dementia risk at, in lo local jurisdictions. And researchers used data from the Chicago Health and Aging Project and uh, looked at demographic risk factors for Alzheimer's in local jurisdictions. Um, the risk factors I think you're familiar with but the estimates that the researchers came up with showed that Maryland has the highest prevalence rates among all the states and that Baltimore City has one of the highest prevalence rates of any uh, local jurisdiction in the, in, the, in the country. Not the kind of ranking that we want to have. We would have much preferred to have the Baltimore Orioles win the playoffs uh, than to get a recognition like this. But in some ways, we weren't surprised because our work in Baltimore is really premised on a couple of factors. And as I think people on this webinar know, uh, older Black Americans are more than twice as likely as white uh, folks of the same age to develop dementia. And dementia is linked to certain chronic diseases, particularly diabetes and heart disease. You then take that into the community level and you look at communities that have traditionally suffered from racial discrimination, including segregation. Those communities tend to have underinvestment in health services and education and employment and housing, all those social determinants of health. And they're more likely to experience high rates of chronic disease. So I think what the research from this summer is really indicating that if you have a community with health disparities and equity issues, then you're probably going to have high rates of dementia. So our work in Baltimore City, which is funded by the Maryland Department of Health, is funded through state funds, although I believe we're in the next round of, uh, of, of bold funding as a state. We've, our work, we've set out to really address this by conducting outreach and education in communities that we've identified that have been traditionally underserved and have high rates of chronic disease and health disparities. And we've worked over the first year of our project with our local Alzheimer's Association chapter, with Johns Hopkins University, and a local health education network called the DBS Healthy Aging Network, which uh, does a lot of good work in the Black community here in the city. And our, the first phase for our project was 
to use volunteers from the Alzheimer's Association to provide educational classes at various locales in the city serving these communities. Locales included senior centers and public housing sites. And our classes this first year used the curriculum developed by the Alzheimer's Association, Healthy Living for the Brain and Body. So we did about seven or eight of these classes and learned from our experience in, in, in doing this, uh, like better how to engage folks in this kind of learning. And we're now moving into our second year. And in our second year, we want to continue and enhance our community education work. But we also want to begin to address the issue of community uh, clinic community linkage uh, by reaching out to health practices and clinics in the city. So for the first part of this, continuing our community education work, we want to strengthen our educational programs because we're finding that we think we need to add supplemental activities to the educational programs that will result with more engagement with participants. For example, if you're doing a healthy lifestyle program, you might want to include a cooking demonstration, or you may want to include an exercise activity such as a dance class. And we think this will help us draw in more people, engage more people, and actually increase the effectiveness of the public health me messaging that we're trying to deliver around brain health. For the second goal, engaging with clinics, we're planning to reach out to clinical staff, probably particularly prioritizing federally qualified health centers to educate clinical staff, not only as to the warning signs and symptoms of ADRD, but also to inform them about the resources available for both persons with ADRD and for their caregivers. These uh, kinds of resources would include the programs offered by the Alzheimer's Association, but also since we're actually, as a, as a health department, we're also an area agency on aging, we have programs for family caregivers that are funded by the Older Americans Act, which aren't always uh, that visible to people in the community. And we think those programs can be particularly supportive for family caregivers who are caring for folks with ADRD. So we think that this two-pronged approach, community education and outreach, and accompanied by linking clinical practices to ADRD resources, we think will not only increase awareness, but will enable those who are facing the challenges of this, of this disease to get help much earlier, which is you know, a key uh, component of, 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 the, of the public health strategy that we talked about earlier. And we think that this strategy is consistent with the spirit and the goals uh, of the new roadmap. So I hope that kind of helps respond to, to the question that you posed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for that, Jim. I, I love the, my, my brain tends to think about, uh, about a lot of issues in supply and demand. Uh, and so, you know, I, I view that, um, that community engagement, that community education, uh, coupled with that provider side, that supply side education, uh, a winning formula for uh, for engaging and getting that awareness uh, increased across the community. So love love to hear about that. Uh, so uh, we are uh, th that was wonderful remarks. We've actually had some great questions come in, and so to our three panelists, um, I wanted to pose just like a a quick. Uh, if you could offer uh, best advice uh, to uh, a colleague in a health department that is just getting started, uh, what would be the one or two sentence uh, advice you would offer to someone that wanted to engage uh, in work similar to, uh, to that that your health department has done? Uh, so I'll go through each of you and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. Uh, and Patty, how about, how about we start with you? What would be your advice to, to someone just starting out in this work? That's a good question. Um, when, I, when I started in this work, I was pretty new to Healthy Brain Initiative and dementia work. Um, and 
just kind of found myself <laughs> in this role and I, I needed to, we have a lot going on in Minnesota, like a lot of different dementia friendly initiative, um, you know, projects and past planning and things like that. So I needed to just get the lay of the land and understand like where we've been and, um, you know, strategic goals and where they were aligned with our funding streams. Um, so relationship building, I think was, was the key for me is just getting to know everyone, what they do, how our roles connect, um, and how to support each other. Excellent. No, I love that. Uh, it's, it's a great place to start. Excellent. Uh, Victoria, what would your advice be? Yeah, I think um, as many people would say, just start somewhere. Um, you know, pick pick a roadmap action and start. Um, sometimes when you're reading the Healthy Brain Initiative roadmap and it's so many pages and it's hard to just pick and choose, and you know, you'll read an action item and you'll think, "What does this mean?" And then you'll use the implementation guides and the issue maps that have been created to support you in that process. Um, but just you know, pick a place and start. Um, and as we've all sort of alluded to, I think partnerships has been a theme um, for a lot of the success stories in the roadmap and other public health programs. Um, and I would say that my my word of advice in partnerships is to offer something in return. Um, and it doesn't always and maybe shouldn't always have to be funding or money. Um, it can just be your time, your expertise, your ability to convene people, um, just to be a true partner uh, in that in that partnership that's so needed to really implement the work that we're doing. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Jim, tidbit of advice? Uh we don't have phone books anymore, and uh, I'm I'm tempted to make a Betty White kind of joke, uh, but uh, find your local Alzheimer's Association. They're going to be your best partner, uh, and I second all all the previous comments about developing partnerships and relationships with the association is critical, and I think the second thing I would say, because it's been very important here in Maryland is don't forget the advocacy piece of this. There's a synergy between advocating for resources for this, in our case, through the state legislature, and then your ability to actually begin to implement some of the roadmap uh, concepts. So uh, the, the, the two really go together. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, that Jim. And uh, I, I agree. There's uh, we from speaking as uh, from the association, we are uh, always happy to engage in this work. We want to engage with this work and partner with health departments at every level across the country. Uh, so if uh, you're not yet connected, please do reach out. Uh, that's exactly what our entire team is here for, as well as all of our chapters across the country. Uh, so please reach out. There's uh, to kind of finalize uh, or, or put a point on what Jim just said. There's a lot of people who are interested in this area. There's a lot of passion in this area. Uh, and so connecting, reaching those partners, starting somewhere uh, is, is uh, a great step forward. Uh, so I successfully took uh, most of our time uh, the, uh, for, for Q&A, but Shelby, uh, any final uh, quick uh, answers to, to provide that came in? Yeah, there were um, some good questions that came and we've answered most of them. The only one that we haven't answered yet that I don't know the answer to, Patty, is for you. And that is about if you could give a little more detail on what you were training the hairstylist to do, what, what kind of training were you providing them with and what were you wanting them to do? Yeah, so we have not done that project yet. We just have had um, some initial conversations about what that could look like. So it's sort of, it's sort of brand new, this idea of um, working with community health workers uh, through community partnerships to train trusted messengers. So that model had worked with caregivers, right? We talked about the oral health uh, train the trainer um, model where caregivers or where community health workers were training caregivers in um, oral health care for people living with dementia. And, and so we're trying to like, think about how we can expand on that model to uh, work with other, you know, folks in the community like hairstylists to, to be kind of a, um, have accurate information about risk reduction, early detection, and where they can go for resources if they're a caregiver, um, in addition to just dementia friendly hair salons and barbershops, which is another, you know, key area. So we're still we're still planning and um, working working it out. Great, thanks for that. And then the last question, John, that I promise I didn't plant is that someone asked if 
there was still going to be an evaluation tool that they remembered us saying that before. So the answer to that is absolutely yes. We wanted to be sure to get these getting started resources out to you all as soon as we could, knowing that the bold grants just started, but that will be coming later this fall. But John, I'll let you close us out. Excellent. Well, I just want to thank all of our panelists, uh, all of our speakers today. Uh, really appreciate your time, sharing your expertise and perspective. Uh, hopefully everyone here uh, on the, uh, the webinar uh, took away some great messaging, took away some great ideas. Um, and it's all about connection uh, from, from my perspective. So uh, please do reach out. We're always happy to, to make additional connections beyond uh, who you see on the webinar screen here. Uh, but we're always happy to connect um, us at the Alzheimer's Association and, uh, of course, our partners uh, working in this space, too. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we would appreciate hearing uh, what you thought of today's presentation. Uh, there is a short uh, evaluation survey that we'll drop in the chat right here. I uh, really appreciate your feedback on, uh, on what worked well and what you would like to see uh, in the future. We will be sharing out, as Shelby said, uh, a recording and the slide deck uh, with everyone that registered. So keep an eye on your inbox for that in the coming days. And with that, I believe we have uh, maybe one more slide, but I think it's just a, a final thank you, everyone. I uh, appreciate your time today. Uh, please do reach out, um, allstar.org slash public health or public health at alz.org if you'd like to email us. Uh, we're happy to connect and answer additional questions.